good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Would you stand with me? Let's begin the worship together. We are grateful to 
be able to come before you as people who love you today, together, in this place. Father, we, we pray that as we come before you and praise you in song, and as we study your word, Lord, we just pray that you transform our hearts so that we are encouraged, so that we uh, can drop our burdens here, Father, and go into our the rest of our lives, the rest of our day today, be in a way that brings you glory. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me again? Let's continue to worship the Lord together.
guy, I don't get to be seen. <laughs> but you do know that um, in ancient times, the preacher sat and everybody else stood. And who had to do that same thing? Or not. Well, I just want you to know that um, I am an eater of bread. I love bread. To me, a meal is not a meal without bread, it's a snack. If I don't have bread, I just don't feel like I have to eat. So, um, I want you to understand that bread takes many forms. This doesn't have cocoa puffs in it, because I hate them all. But bread can take the form of crackers. Bread can take the form of cookies. And bread can take the form of cocoa puffs, too. Even though the ancient world, of course, didn't know anything about corn, maize. Bread's pretty important to us. And uh, I'm getting a little hungry myself right now to handle this bread. I usually eat a snack around 10.30. Uh, it's my cookies for lunch because I figure, hey, you know, let's, let's take care of the important stuff first. And then about 3.30, I get hungry again, and so I'll usually eat some crackers or a uh, quasi-energy bar, which is known as a candy bar. <clears throat> but it's not bread. A candy bar is not bread. But if I think about bread too much, then I'm starving. John chapter 6 and verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Since I'm starving, I need bread. So let's talk about bread. Let's talk about early bread from ancient times. The word bread means, well, it used to mean, to make solid. So the idea is you get all this liquidy stuff together and you turn it into something solid, which of course would be bread. It came to mean any type of solid food. That's why if you read the King James Version of the Bible, you get kind of confused over what people are eating because meat was bread and bread was meat uh, because it was solid food. The first mention of bread is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, pretty close to the very beginning of the creation of the world, where the Lord told Adam, you will eat bread by the sweat of your brow. So, um, obviously, they already knew about bread, or they're about to learn about it pretty soon, anyway. The earliest processed food was bread. And today we have processed bread, um, like Pop-Tarts. No, I don't really like Pop-Tarts. Do you like Pop-Tarts? Raise your hand if you like Pop-Tarts. Oh, we have a lot of Pop-Tarts fans here. Do you like it with the frosting or without the frosting? Who doesn't like it with the frosting? You don't like it with the frosting? I wonder why they even make that. Let me see some people like it without the frosting. Well, anyway, it, uh, in the ancient world, it was the main meal of people. The Israelites mostly ate bread, and they only ate meat on occasion. So sacrifices were real big to them because not only were they worshiping, but uh, in most cases they got part of the sacrifice, part of the meat. And that was the time that they would eat bread. Most of the other time they did not. But bread came in two primary forms. I already told you they didn't have corn, maize, like we have, unfortunately for them. But uh, they had two primary forms of bread. They had wheat and they had barley. And wheat was the preferred type of bread because it produced a finer loaf, a smoother loaf. Not one bread quality, but... Uh, closer to uh, that than the other type they had. It was also the most expensive type of wheat uh, bread. So wheat was expensive, so rich people had it. Poor people had it too when it was in season. Barley was the other type of grain that people had. And this was, a, a, this is what poor people ate uh, because it was half the cost of wheat. And it produced a coarse kind of a Kind of more like a loaf that we kind of know about today, kind of a bigger loaf like that. Uh, but the wheat came into a thin type loaf, about uh, from 
year to year diameter. Of course, people would prefer wheat, but uh, the barley harvest came before the wheat harvest, and so close to the barley harvest, people's wheat ran out, and so they would switch over to barley because that was being harvested, and they would endure that until the wheat harvest came. Oh, we don't just eat one kind of bread. I eat many kinds of bread, and so it's curious to me that we have different ways of making bread, you know, we have sandwich cookies, <laughs> and then we have peanut butter sandwiches, and people in ancient days had all kinds of different breads too. Primarily, uh, they had daily bread, and Passover bread, uh, and a sacrificial type of bread. Let me tell you about how they did this, okay? Daily bread was made, I guess, like bread today. I've never made bread, but I have eaten. Uh, but you take water and you grind up some flour, add salt and leaven, some kind of a yeast and olive oil, and you knead it. I know about kneading. I've done kneading with clay before. And you cook it in disc shapes. In my box is cocoa puffs. It has no cocoa puffs in it. I do have something similar to what they made. This is kind of what the ancient bread would look like. It's pita bread. It's kind of soft. It's softer than theirs would have been. It, it's about this size, about that thick. And uh, if it was good bread, you could tear it and eat it. And that's called breaking bread. Now it's broken. So I'll put it away. Where shall I do this, Scott? Here, that good looks good. <laughs> And so uh, that's the regular type of bread. Passover bread, though, was a little bit different. You know about Passover bread because we eat something similar to that when we have Lord's Supper. It was everything that was in regular bread without the leaven. And so it was thin and hard, and when you broke it, it made a snapping sound, of course. There are different ways to bake bread. Did you know that? The one kind of bread is called uh, <laughs> ash bread as in ashes from a fire ash bread. Ash bread was the most primitive type of bread. When Jesus met the apostles on the seashore after he resurrected and fed them fish, remember? And he fed them bread. It was probably ash bread. Let me tell you how to make ash bread. You build a fire and you heat stones, big stones. And then when the stones are hot, you brush off all the debris, the ashes and stuff. And then you take your batter and you pour it on the stones. And then they do something that's kind of curious because you clean off all the debris, right? Then they take the ashes and they pour it on top of the bread. Sounds kind of nice. I saw your eyes open. <laughs> Sounds kind of nasty. Nice. Again, why clean up the debris if you're going to just put more on top of it? But that was ash bread. And that was considered okay if you're going to go camping, if you're going to be out. Oh, Jesus said it to his disciples, so it couldn't be all that bad. So that's ash bread. The second kind of bread would be pan bread. Now this sounds like you would take a pan and you would put that inside it, but that's not at all what they did. Well, they sometimes they did, but most of the time they would eat stones. And then they would take the skillet and they would turn it upside down. And then they would pour the batter on top of the skillet, and then that would heat up, and that would make the disc that we just had. Sometimes people were rebellious, and they would flip it over, they put olive oil on the inside, and they would pour the batter on the inside. But those were rebels. And those skillets would be made either of iron or ceramic. I guess that would be a pretty good type of bread. The best bread, though, they couldn't make it until the first century because they invented the oven. So they had a clay oven, which was oh, about so high, and had a big hole in it where you would put the fire. And you could cook it on top, or you could cook it inside, and actually you were baking the bread. That was the preferred bread because that bread was soft and chewy and similar to that pita bread that I just ripped in half. Bread was important. 
because they ate it at every meal. And sometimes that's all they ate at the meal. Sometimes they throw in some vegetables, and like I said, only occasionally did people eat meat. Bread was so important that it created symbolism of bread. So bread was symbolic of sacredness. It was considered a gift from God. And so people would never waste bread. They would never, they would eat all the bread that was on the table. They wouldn't throw it out to the birds. You guys still throw your bread out to the birds? When I was a kid, we'd throw bread out to the birds when we were down with the bee. Does anybody do that? You still do that? Eat the bird from the bread? Got two people still doing that. I don't know why we don't do that anymore. But we don't. But they wouldn't because it was too sacred for the birds. And they would never step on it because that was a sign of disrespect. It was a gift from God. It was a symbol of hospitality. No one could ever come to your house without at least eating bread. When Jesus was preaching to 5,000 men and who knows how many women and kids, it was turning dark and he said, we got to feed these people. Jesus was feeding these people partly because it was inhospitable not to feed your guests. And these 5,000 people were Jesus' guests. So he wanted to feed them some bread. And of course, he worked a miracle that you're familiar with. It was a symbol of loyalty, too. To eat the king's bread meant to agree with the king. So when Daniel was brought into Babylonian captivity, they said, okay, Daniel, this is the diet you're going to have. You're going to have the same thing as the king because we want you to have the very best. And Daniel said, I can't eat that stuff. This stuff is contrary to the law of Moses. I can't eat this stuff. Now, Daniel was taking a great risk because to refuse to eat the bread of the king, and all the foods considered bread now under this, this definition, to refuse to eat the bread of the king is to insult him. It's to say, I'm not loyal to you. It's to say, I don't agree with your policies. It's in a space type thing. And, of course, Daniel was saved by divine intervention with that. But it, it was bad thing for him to say. In the book of Kings, there are prophets of Baal that are said to eat at the table of Jezebel. And what that meant was they ate at the table of Jezebel. <laughs> I guess they had to be a long table with 400 people. But it meant that they ate the food that Jezebel provided. It meant that she provided their living and it also meant that they were loyal to her because they ate the queen's bread. So bread was symbolic of royalty. It was also symbolic of identification. You know, the sacrifices that Israel offered were not just meat. Sometimes they offered bread. And sometimes it was grain, uh, which would be considered bread. And when a person offered sacrifice, what they were doing was they were, they were symbolically transferring their sins to the sacrifice. And then the sacrifice was, was going to be burned, and the sacrifice was dying or being annihilated. And that was a symbol that their sins were being annihilated, forgiven. So symbolism at the altar as well as other places. The sacrifice absorbs the sin, and the sacrifice is destroyed, thus the sins are destroyed. Now all of this symbolism, this tradition, this history, swarmed about in the minds of the people as they were listening to Jesus teach in John chapter 6. And he said in verse 35, which is like the, the culmination of the apex, he said, I am the bread of life. Bread is essential to life. For most of the world, if you didn't have bread, you starve. We have many alternatives, but that's what they had. And Jesus is the better bread. Yesterday, from John chapter 6 and verse 35, Jesus was teaching. Jesus was healing the sick. And at the end of the day, he fed the 5,000 people with five barley loaves, the poor bread, and two fish. Now don't get the idea that those barley loaves were this size, because they, they would not have been. They were the little kids' lunch. 
So they were probably the size of, oh, maybe um, that size. <laughs> okay? And that would be enough for lunch. Eat five of those and eat two fish. And that should handle it for a while. And in turn, of course, those five barley loaves and two fish into enough food to feed uh, 5,000 men, women and children, and have 12 baskets full. Again, those baskets would have been so tall. Okay? So around like that. So he worked a great miracle. Today, in John chapter 6, after John chapter 6 and verse 35, the crowds are following Jesus. <coughs> Jesus, in the middle of the night, got in a boat and piloted that boat to Capernaum across the sea because he's trying to escape the crowds and get a little bit of personal time. But they followed him. And so Jesus began to teach them in John chapter 6, if you want to read with me, around verse 26. Jesus answered and said to them, this is nice, most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man gives you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. So Jesus said, you're not here because you want to hear about God's truth. You're here because you're hungry. I mean, after all, it's been several hours since you've eaten. And Jesus is implying, I'm not going to give you any more bread, any more physical food. But I will give you what you ultimately need, and that is the bread of life. So there's some questioning and some skepticism that goes on between Jesus and his, uh, his students. He says in verse 28, it says in verse 28, then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? What one thing should we do that we can be saved? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he sent. So if you want to, if you, if, if you have to have works based salvation <laughs> instead of faith, that's the work of God, to believe. Okay? This is the work of God. Therefore, verse 30, they said to him, What sign will you perform to him? This is so funny. What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Come on, I just turned five barley loaves into enough food to feed 5,000 people. What sign should I? But see, they're looking for a deeper sign. They're looking for a spiritual sign. They are expecting man from the Messiah. So man, yeah, man. The rabbis had taught that when the Messiah comes, the manna would fall again from him. Now let me remind you what manna was. When Israel was in the wilderness, they had escaped Egypt, and they were in the wilderness, there was nothing to eat because it's like the wilderness. And they can't stop and have farms, especially not immediately. And the food they brought back from Egypt, they ate. And so here they are, they don't have anything to eat. And Moses says, hey, what about this guy? Don't worry about it, wake up in the morning and your, your needs will be fed. And so in the middle of the night, manna fell. Now manna was grain. It was round. Little pieces of grain, and it covered the ground, and it was golden in color. So they woke up, and it looked like golden frost all over the, 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 all over the ground. And God instructed them, okay, I want you to take, uh, I want you to pick up one, <clears throat> excuse me, one omer of bread, bread, man, per person. Now, one omer is about five cups, five dry cups. That would be enough to make enough bread for one day for one person. So they woke up in the morning, there it was, and they gathered it, and, and the Bible says it tasted like, well, ice cream cone cups. <laughs> that's not what the Bible says, but that's what it would have tasted like. That or donuts. Well, yeah, uh, it 
had this kind of a sweet taste of kind of, you know, the best part of an ice cream cone is, is the very bottom, isn't it? Yeah, so ice cream's all packed in there. It's just, that's what man would taste of mine. <laughs> and so they, they ate this for 40 years as they wandered around in the wilderness, and it, it fortified them. Now, if they took too much, the Bible says, it would turn into worms. Worms would get it in and eat it up. So you couldn't get more than you needed for one day, except on Friday, in which case you got double the amount because you weren't supposed to work on Saturday. So you'd have, uh, you'd bake your bread for Saturday on Friday, which is the Saturday, 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 and then you would be all set for, for that day. The rabbis thought, the rabbis taught that when the Messiah comes, manna would return. And so if Jesus is going to be the Messiah, and Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, then where's the manna? That's the sign they're referring to. What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? Are you going to bring us men? Because that's what the Messiah is supposed to bring. Jesus, though, said, I'm better than man of bread. John chapter 6 and verse 32. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven. But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus claimed to be the manna. That is, the manna was a symbol of Jesus. Now, how is Jesus like man? Well, Jesus like man because he said both of them come from heaven. Both of them were free. Nobody had to buy the man. Nobody had to plant the man. It just showed up. Both of them give life. But Jesus is better than the man. Because you have to continually eat the man. Every morning you have to get up and collect the man. But Jesus, you only have to receive him one time. And he gives you eternal life that time. And you never have to eat him again. The manna kind of got boring. Now, I like ice cream and I like ice cream cones, but I, and I like cocoa puffs, but I'm not going to eat them every day. Sometimes I'll eat raisin bran. And sometimes I'll eat golden bran. Sometimes I'll eat some of those other adult cereals. <laughs> but I'm not going to eat them every day. And manna after, oh, I suppose about 30 years got to be boring. Maybe sooner than that. But Jesus never gets bored. You take him one time, he stays with you all times, and every day he is new. And those of you that have been saved for more many years understand this more than those that have only been saved for a little bit of time. You know that Jesus is always new. Manna symbolized Jesus. You eat manna, and you live. You eat Jesus and you live. But how do you eat Jesus? That's really a strange thing. Well, that was the question they asked Jesus in verse 52 of chapter 6, John. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now think about this. They're thinking about this in a literal way. Um, that's kind of nasty. Okay, We're talking cannibals. It's even nastier to the Jews who were prohibited from eating blood because blood is inside the flesh, and it's just it's just a horrible thought. They they were lit, they were taking this literally. How do you eat Jesus? Well, Jesus helps us out here in chapter six and verse forty. We're going to compare this to another verse. And this is the will of Him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have everlasting life. I will raise him up on the last day. Now, I want you to compare this to his answer to how you eat Jesus in verse 54. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Do you see the parallels in verse 40 and verse 54? We have someone who uh, is getting everlasting life, 
We have someone who's going to be raised at the last day. Jesus is saying that to eat me is to believe in me, to put your faith in me, to trust me. If you trust me, it is as if you have eaten me. It means invite me into your life. Now, when you eat bread, where does that bread go? It goes into your in, through your bloodstream and it makes cells, and those cells make flesh, and it's whatever bread I ate a month ago is still with me. Okay? At least a lot of it is. And it's, it, I guess it will always be with me because I've got a body because of it. That's maintained my body, that's created new flesh. Do something, not do the hair, but other things. <laughs> when you accept Jesus into your life, He becomes a part of you. Your spirit and His spirit are joined. And it's forever changed, and He's forever with you. So that's how you, you eat Jesus. You invite Him into your life, and He literally joins with your life to become, to create a new life in you. John chapter 6 and verse 56 says it like this. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Jesus is the bread of life. And Jesus offers you eternal life. So I'm going to invite you to invite him into your life. And know that he will stay with you forever. And if you have already invited Jesus into your life, then you know that he's with you. You know that he's new every day. And I want you just to reflect on how Jesus is new to you today. Different today than he was to you sometime in the past. We're going to have our invitation. Brother Scott is a grouper coming up to lead us. If you need to talk to me or Brother Scott or another staff member, we'll be around after the service and you can talk to us.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this time to be here together to worship you and to learn from your word. Lord, help us to be hungry. Hungry for the bread that you offer, Lord. Help us to seek you and your word and your son. And help us to be more and more like him as we grow closer to you every single day. Lord, bless us as we leave this place. We ask that your hand of blessing upon, be upon us as we go out into, this, into our town and we, we uh, do our various things and go our various places. Lord, we give you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. You're just